Bremer Bank has a history of making a real difference in the lives of our customers and the communities we call home. We're proud to work with the people who grow our food, build our economy, and serve our neighbors. We know you're not just looking for a bank. You're looking for a partner to help navigate financial challenges today and long into the future. One who's ready to roll up their sleeves and find a way to get things done. That's where we come in. Bremer Bank has the resources, experience, and knowledge to solve your toughest problems, along with the vision and innovation to help you seize your biggest opportunities. We know our customers and why they live and work here. Because we do too. Let's see what we can do together. That was lovely. Jean, thank you for being here and you know, coming here and addressing our group. Um, I'd like to just start off by asking you, I know Bremer is a little bit younger than the Carlson School. I think it's about 75 years old. And, and it's you know, based in St. Paul, and uh, it was established in St. Paul in 1943. And so can you tell us a little bit about the origins of Bremer Bank? Sure. No, I, I love talking about our, our founder, Otto Bremer, because really the story of Otto is the story of Bremer Bank. And I just want to point out before I lose the thought that in that video, we, we did that as part of our new branding work, and every person you saw in there was either a Bremer employee or a real customer. And we had so much fun creating that. And it really goes to who we are in terms of how we build relationships. But this is all about how Otto Bremer, who was a German immigrant, he came here in his late teens, and uh, he, he landed in St. Paul, Minnesota, got off the train, and he had a real love for banking. He had actually been an intern in a banking program over in Germany, but he Im immigrated here with his younger brother. And, in, by, and that was in 1886. And in 1887, he became a bookkeeper for the German National Bank, which was in downtown St. Paul. And for those of you who've been around for a while, that eventually became the American National Bank. And uh, Otto um, really just enjoyed learning the business, investing in the business, became quite successful. But there's a little detour in Otto's story, and it involves the business of beer. And, uh, and we love that at Bremer, because we always say that banking and beer go together quite well at Bremer. Yeah. But what happened is Otto's younger brother immigrated with him as well, and he absolutely um, was fortunate enough to work for the Schmidt Brewery Company at the time. And he uh, also was fortunate to fall in love and marry Marie Schmidt, who was the daughter of Jacob Schmidt, the owner. And uh, what happened is the two brothers were quite close, and as much as Otto was in the banking business, he also followed his brother into the beer distribution business. And the importance of that is because Otto really got to know the, uh, the whole Midwest by virtue of this beer distribution business. And it was through that that he discovered uh, just the, the value and the fun of working in rural communities. And he started investing in and supporting a lot of small rural banks. And uh, by, in the, by the late 1930s, he had acquired 55 community banks. Now you all know the late 1930s was the begin, you know, in the thrust of the Great Depression. And uh, what Otto did was, uh, really, was really concerned about the failing of those banks. And over the course of his career, he had had an opportunity to not only invest in banking, but also invest in, in Schmidt Brewery. And really, it was the, uh, the collateral supporting uh, these failed banks with Otto's personal investments that he contributed to keep these banks afloat coming out of his, uh, his investment ownership in, in the brewery business and with his brothers as well. There's a great story of Otto who um, got a call from a director in a bank in Crookston, Minnesota, and this was, they were so fearful of a run on a bank, and he actually uh, grabbed a satchel of cash, greenbacks they were called at the time, and mm -hmm. took a train up to Crookston, Minnesota, and in the lobby of the bank, they set out a table with greenbacks just to prove that the bank had liquidity to prevent a run on the bank. I don't think you could do that today, but, um, but it worked. And, and, and just that that's the kind of commitment he had to rural banking and to the communities. He always felt that he was so successful because the community supported him and believed in his success. Otto uh, never married. 
he never had any children, and so he was uh, in, he was challenged in in his mid 80s, really, and this is in the 1940s, to establish an estate planning uh, success and succession for this this wealth and this, these banks that he had acquired because he didn't want his banks buried with him, and he wanted them to keep going on. And so his commitment to communities was so real because what he did is also the year after he established his bank holding company in 1943. He established the Otto Bremer Trust in 1944 with the charitable giving of the trust supported by the uh, success of the, the profits of the banking institution. And at the, at, initially that was 100% ownership. Over the course of time there were tax laws that changed. In 1989 the structure, uh, the stock structure ownership changed to, to a some, small degree. Today, the bank is owned 8% by employees through an ESOP and through, from a director and, and uh, ownership as well. And Otto Bremer Trust owns 92% of the bank. And that was they, what they really were speaking to was a tax law change that prevented a private foundation from owning more than 20% of the voting rights of an, of an operating business. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so that voting structure changed in 1989. Mm -hmm. So 8% of this ownership represents 80% of the voting rights. Wow. And 92% of the ownership has 20% of the voting rights. So today, we, here we are, a $12 billion financial institution. Wow. And last year, um, we, gave, we had a record year of giving dividends to OBT of $70 million over the last 10 years. That giving has totaled over about $436 million. I think Otto would be super proud of what uh, this has that become. Is, that's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Also, just you know, it so exemplifies you know the way we approach business itself. Business is a force for good. Yeah. This idea that you know there is a profit-making corporation and there's a trust and there's a this relationship between them. I think it's actually you know one of the most positive things that I've heard. You know, which is wonderful. Yes. Anyway, 75 years, right? And so, why the rebranding? I mean, you mentioned that you had rebranded, and yeah. Yeah. So, what 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 sort of drove that, and what is the reason for it? Well. Um, the world's changing fast, and it's changing every day. We always say that that external world is changing faster than any organization can change internally. And so we are so proud of that dynamic heritage, that, that, that ability to say we've been around 75 years. But uh, what we always say and what I really emphasize with our team is that unfortunately, you can't take a look at those 75 years and say, if we just keep doing that, it'll take us forward another 75. Sure. If anything, it'll get you in trouble. And so we really uh, challenged ourselves to understand going back to really a, a self-reflection of what our business purpose was and, and, and really identifying who we are because it's all about being relevant, how you compete today, how you stay in tune with your customers' preferences and how you really understand the competitive landscape and how it's changing. So we really started that whole branding work with an, an understanding of the external analysis, what's going on around us, but then having, you know, and as much as that can be overwhelming at times, really understanding what lanes can we drive in, what, where can we find our growth. And, and when we started the branding work, one of the things we did was initially we had, brand had uh, been part of our marketing team. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, I felt it was so important for us as individuals, as employees, to understand who we were all about. And, and because the brand is really lived through the experience that you have in meeting a member of our team and how we execute on that. So I took brand out of marketing and I put it into human resources. Our head of HR is sitting here today. I think the board had a little bit of buyer's remorse because I did that about a month after I became CEO. But, uh, but they, they, they challenged that to a degree and I just, I, I just knew it was so important for us to really do that self-reflection, get that understanding of who we were. And so it was a two years labor of love, labor of work, and really understanding how that how we needed to go forward. And through the course of that work, what we did is really um, really defined who we were, who our business purpose, what our business purpose was, and then we started on the fun work of, of 
creating visual representations of that and really uh, challenging ourselves to speak uh, to the segments that we were trying to reach. And so we did a, we did a ton of work and our, and our new CMO came in and, and Aaron Dady, who used to work here at the U, yes. did, did that, led that work for us. And the, the critical nature about, about that was really understanding, and frankly, it, it started with Aaron because when we, we had a, a CMO who had retired and so we had an opportunity to go out and, and bring someone new in. And when we were working with the, the folks that were helping us search for this new chief marketing officer for us, I said, what I want is someone that has never worked for a bank. I want someone that doesn't <laughs> think they know how to market a bank. And, and Aaron, uh, Aaron has learned uh, banking in spades, but has brought, it's, it's looking around those corners, it's offering new perspectives, and it's really challenging us to think differently about and understand from a, from a purpose-driven business model how do we then present ourselves in the marketplace? And so we did, you know, we, we, we really think it's important to, to do a new brand at this point in time was really signaling a change to the marketplace to understand that we are relevant, that we were challenging ourselves to, to meet the needs of our customers who are always really informing us that they expect uh, new solutions, they expect new tools, they expect new ways of working with us. But we also know that they value and prioritize a personal relationship. And so that's the work that we brought together. And in the course of this, we had, we had a vision statement, we had a mission statement, we had belief statements, all so many words and paragraphs that frankly I could never even remember them and let alone recite them. Right. And, and what we did was uh, challenge ourselves to come up with three key words to say what's our purpose. And that's where we came up with cultivating thriving communities mm -hmm. because cultivating is our legacy, it's our heritage, it really speaks to who we are. And thriving for us means that if our customers are thriving, the communities in which we're doing business are thriving. And, and then, you know, Communities. It's it's for us. It's just the ultimate who of of why we do business, why we, why we're important, and the impact that we're trying to make. And so a lot of that uh, was the culmination of challenging ourselves, meeting our needs, understanding the external environment, and uh, and creating this more modern sense of who we are and and how we move forward in the marketplace to uh, to be around not only for 75 more years, but hopefully well beyond. I love that. I think our HR faculty would love being able to own brand from, from our marketing faculty. But I think it's also what you're really talking about is that you've really tried to think about a new strategy. It's, you know, it's beyond the brand. I think the brand is important, and I think what you're doing in terms of the, uh, working on the culture, I guess getting it into the HR is really sort of embedding it into the, you know, the entire sort of organization, getting the idea yes. behind the brand into the, into the organization. But it also seems really a, a, a sort of a new strategy or a new way to think about strategy. So I'm wondering, what, did you make some strategic changes as you did this rebranding exercise? You talked about figuring out which tracks you were playing in. So what were those sure. changes? You know, it actually that actually preceded the brand work, okay. and, and so when I got into the role in early, in mid in mid sixteen, and and worked with my senior leadership team on really understanding again uh, what was going on in the industry, and it's changing quickly. Sure. And uh, some people use transformation, some people use the words upheaval, some people use the words that, you know, it, it, you know the, the digital is here to change the size of the number of banks that we have. So we looked at all of that. But, um, but what we really did is, is take a look at who we were, what our balance sheet was, and you know who our primary customer base was, and it and it we really haven't shifted to any great degree from what we've been for a long, long period of time. We are a commercial and agricultural bank, but we were operating more as a generalist. And I would tell you, I would challenge anybody today that just since you can go out and be everything to everybody, it's uh, it's harmful to the organization. And so we saw that eroding a business opportunity, especially as you grow because you have to grow. And, 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 and so we were focused on how do we take 
these client segments that we know we are expert at, that we have, um, we have a, a great base of business, and how do we continue to expand as a commercial and agricultural bank? And that's where we laid our, our emphasis and our stake in the ground in terms of driving growth. It doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of other capabilities that support those, those segments of the marketplace, but first and foremost, we, we approached it through specialization and customer segmentation. And that was the one key priority. We actually came up with three key priorities for our strategy. The second was all about optimization and, and you know, using, using the different channels of delivery and working with customers. And that doesn't mean just looking at your, your geographic footprint and, um, and understanding you know, different patterns of customer traffic. But it, it, it did mean that, but it also meant where aren't we and where do we need to be from a physical standpoint. And it also really meant how we're really understanding the customer and their preferences. So when we built the strategy, we actually, we call it the pinwheel. We put the customer right at the core of it. And everything we do in every business decision we're gonna make is, is centered around what's important to that customer. And we looked at our core banking products and services and, and knew where we had some gaps where we needed to fill in there. We also knew that we had great partnerships within the organization, other business lines that supported those key customer segments. We also recognized that we had expertise throughout our three-state region, throughout our whole footprint, but we weren't leveraging that expertise. So how do you get um, an organization comfortable with you know, understanding that there is opportunity to really be stronger by bringing the whole together? And then finally, we looked at strategic external partnerships as well. Those were key ingredients for the strategy to understand how we move forward right. and, and stayed relevant. And bringing all that work together then culminated in this understanding of it being a specialized bank in commercial and egg with the primary focus, optimizing our delivery channels, and then doing the brand work was the third big priority. Just a quick comment on the optimization. What was really interesting for us, and I think it speaks to a lot of us in financial services who are challenged with this today, is the world is changing quickly on the digital mm -hmm. front. Sure. And Absolutely. customers are really asking for that. They need and expect these solutions. But uh, again, we, we know that they prioritize a personal relationship. So we're trying to combine those two. Mm -hmm. But what we did challenge ourselves to do is understand that if we're going to broaden the depth and the opportunity and solutions that we can bring to our customers in that com those commercial and egg segments, right. let's, let's figure out uh, how we can do that a little bit faster. And we have a, a, a chief strategy officer today who has someone who works for him who is a chief um, strategy partnership developer. These are, or, these are jobs that we didn't have in the past. And that has led us to a strategic corporate partnership with uh, an accelerator out in Silicon Valley. And what's fascinating about that is that this is, a, you know, this is an organization that's able to vet thousands of new startups, technology startups. They have 13 different verticals that they, um, they have expertise in. We're in three of those, so we're in food tech, we're in egg, t um, well, food and egg go together, so the food mm -hmm. tech, FinTech, and then cybersecurity tech. What that does for us is it just really accelerates our opportunity to find opportunities where we can partner with folks that really add value and solutions to our customers. So not only are we doing that, but then we're also building stuff ourselves. Right. And we recently um, were able to attract a, a very talented leader of our digital strategy who has a magnet for talent. He's brought other people in as well. What I've heard so many banks our size, mid-sized banks, say is that you know, we can't innovate, we'll be a fast follower, we can, we can figure out uh, what's going on and then try to plug it in. And we certainly have those opportunities and talk about that, but we also think that we need to innovate ourselves. Honestly, I don't know how you grow today if you don't think about innovation mm -hmm. as being key to what you do. Right. And so we're, we're really focused on that and we're putting some real investment into that. But in a, you know, we're, we're so fortunate to be part of, our headquarters are in this amazing community where there's some real leaders in healthcare, there's leaders in retail that uh, really have taught us about the changing needs of customers in the marketplace and have attracted talent. And we're, we're finding access to that talent to help us do what we need to do to be relevant as a, as a mid-sized bank.
That's fantastic. It really is. I don't, you know, I think Otto Bremer would probably recognize some parts of your bank and your strategy right now, <laughs> but probably not a lot of the others. And that is yeah. amazing for a mid-sized bank to be at the forefront of innovation. I think that is uh, absolutely extraordinary. Uh, you yourself, you've been in the banking business now for a long time. You know, what changes have you seen and, you know, how, you know, how has that impacted how you've led or how you lead now in, in Bremer Bank, your experiences to date? You know, it has changed a lot, but I would tell you core to when I started. I have been in the industry a long time, 37 years, and what's always kept me in this business is I just, I just love the customers. I love what I do. I'm passionate about making impact with the with individuals who are really trying to make, who really do make the impact in the communities in which we're doing business. But it, it always, always goes back to people. Our, our team, our high-performing team, is at the center of our strategy. So as much as, as, much as I talk about a strategy mm -hmm. where we put the customer in the center of it to determine how we support and, and provide a great experience to that customer, when I talk about how you get that done, it's through a high-performing team. That team is the center of what we have. It's our, it's our greatest asset. It always has been and always will be. Mm -hmm. um, I think over time what I've seen change more than anything is the, the nature of, of work is changing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard to predict um, how, you, uh, how you come into an organization with the job that you have and, and, and change as, as our world continues to change. And so what I think really has driven us um, you know, our, our, our long-term success is, is a team that's collaborative, that mm -hmm. they work together, that, you know, we, we have as part of our value system that we talk about is collaboration and commitment and uh, creativity. And as much as we talk about that from an external standpoint, being committed to our customers and being collaborative and understanding their needs and, and to the community as well. And, 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 but being creative and collaborative and commitment is just as important internally. And we, we actually use a phrase called one Bremer. And, uh, and that's just not words that sound great. It's, it's really words that have a lot of definition and meaning behind them and the expectations of how we work together. But it really is through, through a team that recognizes you need to change. Now, it's not easy. The mm -hmm. hardest thing about change, I mean, it's hard to change as an adult, Absolutely. right? And, yes. and uh, you know, but I think we have a team that we're trying to stay very communicative with, explaining what we're doing, why we're doing it. I think the, the biggest challenge as a leader is to make sure that you're always talking about the why, why it's so important to change. And one, one thing that we've discovered is that it's not just communication. You always talk about, well, it's more and more communication. I really think it's how you communicate. It's the nature of the communication. And, and what we find most, most important is being transparent and offering clarity. And, and sometimes clarity, you can, you can worry about exactly what that means to different people, but I will tell you, I'll take clarity over perfection all day long. I think it's really important for people to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, and that transformation, or that transparency is hard because it's, uh, you get a little vulnerable in that sure? process. Yeah. But I think vulnerability is, is a necessary part of being a good leader today. And I think that's what I feel. If, you know, I think about some of those things that feel different to right. me. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's how, you, how you have to connect. I, I try to spend, and so do our senior leadership team. Mm -hmm. And again, all of this is driven by a team. I never think of this as hierarchy. Right. Uh, to me, we all have different jobs. We have different responsibilities. But the best opportunity for us to find success is how we all talk together as a team. I, I try to go out and meet uh, with our new, uh, new employees joining the organization. Sure. Um, and I just had a meeting yesterday in, in talking with them. And, and, and it's just, it's, it's, it's that connectivity we build. And it's that encouragement of being a team that sees the long-term value and not being afraid of, of change. One thing we did at the end of last year, which is, is always really difficult, but I would tell you, we did it from a position of strength. We weren't trying to just manage the bottom line and cut expenses, but we challenged ourselves to think about what jobs are outmoded in the organization. What jobs are redundant in this organization? What jobs were here in 1980, 1990, maybe 2007 that just don't apply because the world has changed and the work we're changing. And so we eliminated roles 
and, and that has allowed us to continue to move forward. It's how you have to run a business today. Right. And, and in, in eliminating some roles allowed us, frankly, to invest in new roles. When I talk about digital and the strategy, yeah. it's how we drive that forward. So when, when banks say we don't have the, the uh, opportunity to have those investment in that capital to make those investments, you can find it. You can go out there and find it. It's not easy work. It's constant work. But that's that's what we've challenged ourselves to do. That, I mean, it's what you stop doing. I mean, that's a part of strategy as well. Yeah. And I think our undergraduate associate dean is sitting here, and he'd be very happy to hear that you're really focused on the whys of business, because one of the values that we're promoting to our undergrads is why before how. And it's there's also we before I and work before reward, but why before how is a very important part of it. So. Very yeah. glad that you're able to sort of uh, feed into that. It's fun to find people, too, in your organization. I would tell you the best, speaking to newer college grads or people that are just getting going in their careers, I mean, our success is really driven by people that are continuous learners. That people mm -hmm. want to be continuous learners, and you can be any age and be a continuous learner. I, I mean, I, I think that's what's kept me interested more than anything. But fast learners and continuous learners, because you can never predict where that job is going and how it's going to change. So I, I really find that that is, is key, and we really focus on that through the development of our people to retain and, and to attract and to, and to develop talent. Well, I, th you know, I, I don't want to sort of keep the audience from asking questions, but maybe one last question to you before we throw it open to the audience, which is, you know, what about your own leadership journey? Did you know at age 10 that you wanted to be a CEO of a bank? <laughs> you know? So just give us a little bit of a, an idea, because I think there are a lot of students out here as well who would love to know what path you took. You know, I, no, I didn't know at age 10. Although I would tell you I, I had uh, such a great learning experience. I grew up um, in a small business. My, my dad was a watchmaker and my mom was part of that business and, and they had a jewelry store and, and, and sold gifts and it was in a small town in central North Dakota. But I, I saw the, the uh, I saw what it took to be a business owner. And so when I got into banking and started working with these, my first job was really working with small business owners. It always reminded me of my parents and all the hats that they wore and all the work that they did to try to be successful as a business owner. And, and what got me hooked more than anything as I found my, I, an opportunity uh, in my early days of banking to get into commercial lending and meet with customers. That's always been my, the hook and the draw and, the, and the, ten, you know, the tenacity that people had in doing what they want to do for their families and their goals was always so interesting to me and, and it was really the, the, the variety of life. And, and I, I guess it goes, just goes back to so having passion about what you do, right? And, and having joy in your work. And, and that doesn't mean that every day is terrific, but it does mean that you really, the source of what kind of feeds your soul comes from the fact that you've got passion about what you're doing. And, and uh, you know, lots of lessons learned along the way. There's, there's, I always talk about the resilience that's needed. I talk about the fact that, you know, sometimes early on in, in the banking industry, and, and uh, again, back in when I was working as a commercial banker, um, I was one of one, one female in a group of, of, of a number of males, and I just never saw that as anything other than I'm trying to learn what they're trying to do, and so. Um, just really always being authentic, but I remember the, the days where I tried to wear a tie to work to look like one of them. Well, I didn't know how to tie a tie, so that was a disaster. Um, so I had one of the guys at work tie my tie for me. Um, but you know, it's 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 doing. Uh, you know, it's it's those lessons that teach you to be more authentic because I always showed up best when I was just myself, and always being resilient uh, when you had times of failure. But again. Uh, those little doses of failure are really the building blocks of resiliency and, and the strength and the learning that you get. And again, I think it just all of those experiences just make you more human and uh, hopefully better at what you do, and, and especially when you're charged and have the responsibility for leading people as well. Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. And we will... We do have two folks with mics, so I know there will be questions from the audience. Please raise your hands if you have questions for Jean. There's a question there. 
Hi, Gene. Can you talk about your experience on the Federal Reserve Board? Anything there that you see from trends that are coming or just kind of your experience of being on the board? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I got a whole table here that's going <laughs> to... You know, I, so here's what I would say. It's, oh, it's been an amazing experience already, and I've only been on the board since January of this year. Um, what I've lear really learned to appreciate is just, we have just an amazing bank here in Minneapolis. We have amazing leadership of the bank with Neil Kashkari and just the talented professionals that work at the bank and the economists. They're so smart. And, uh, and, and just the, the ability for them to translate their work into an understanding. I'm in the business of banking, and so being part of this board is especially rewarding because I can take what I'm learning back uh, to to the workplace uh, that I'm uh, you know that I live in every day. But it's also learning from each other, and there's lots of talent on that board. But what's what I would tell you what's been most striking for me is is to gain a broader appreciation and understanding of how decisions are made at the Fed, and that is really you know there's 12 reserve banks in the country, and there's nine um, you know nine members on each each nine boards of directors on each of those banks, but there's also the Federal Open Market Committee and there's the Board of Governors and there's all these, this information that is shared broadly through those, through those banks by these different directors. And so what the Fed has a reach into every corner of the country with every kind of industry, because so there's, there's only three of us that are in the banking industry as board of directors. The other six are really uh, individuals from all walks of life representing all kinds of economic uh, you know, disciplines and, and industries. But the reach within the whole broad country uh, to get that information, to make the decisions that they do, I've gained such an appreciation for. And it's, um, it's, it's just really a rewarding and uh, really an honor to be on the board. Absolutely, and I'd second every word that you said. <clears throat> you put it beautifully, so. Other questions? Hi, uh, you discussed that in order to uh, expand your, perhaps your horizons and the ability to serve your customers, you're engaging in a variety of strategic alliances. What kind of alliances are you talking about and how does that help you in the bank? Sure. Well, right now we're really starting on, on a couple of fronts. One is, is more on the digital uh, front. And so this is about solutions. And where we've started that discussion is really with our customers themselves, understanding their preferences, how they want to work with us, what are their pain points. And so again, when, we, when we're working with this uh, accelerator, this organization out of Silicon Valley, and when you sit down, it's kind of like a, a shark tank, tank environment. You sit down with uh, different entrepreneurs that have different solutions. What you have a chance to do is evaluate what their idea is and understand whether or not that's going to make a difference to your customer. And so those alliances that we've developed have really, at this point in time, really just broadened our, our thinking, broadened our understanding. One uh, particular tool that we recently rolled out uh, was, it, it's called, we, we call it the Bremer Edge. And this is a tool, it's an end-to-end -end, uh, lending solution really for small businesses and so that where you can go online and you can apply and you can get a decision and you can get funds really within minutes. Now we're certainly not the first to market with that at all. But, um, but we took some time to develop it because here's what's important to us. We can create a, a, a digital solution, but a digital solution is meant to enhance a relationship in, in, in our culture. So we don't want to just have someone go online and have that be their experience with us. We want someone to have the, the convenience and the efficiency and the everything they need to operate their business, but we also want to make sure that we are partnering that with what's core to us in relationship banking, making sure that we are serving that customer in a way as an advisor, as a, as a resource for any other um, you know, tools that they may need to run a better business operation or a farming operation. So we're specifically looking at agriculture and, and small business today, and, uh, and we anticipate that going in a number of different directions. It's a process that we, we anticipate uh, being very uh, you know, thrust into and engaged in for the next number of years.
Jean, uh, great information. Thank you. Can you share your thoughts on women uh, leadership development and uh, diversity and inclusion in your organization? Thank you. Sure. Well, it's hugely important. I would, uh, I would tell you the way I think about it and really our organization thinks about it, um, whether, whether you think about women in the industry and or you think about all uh, minorities in the industry, all diversity to me, it's not anything other than a business issue. It critically is a business issue because again, the complexity of our communities is changing. How you pay attention to that is how you pay attention to um, you know, the business imperative of having a broad range of not only employees, but customers you're working with and understanding the needs. So we have, I recently was part of the Atasca cohort that focused on diversity and inclusion and learned so much in that process, not only by uh, understanding where we were at as compared to other peers within the, you know, within the, uh, the Twin Cities marketplace, but also understanding what others are doing. So we approach it through a few ways. Our CHRO is now in that cohort for uh, the Itasca cohort as well. You learn a lot by understanding what others are doing, but what's more critical than anything is really to put a stake in the ground to say, here's how we're gonna make a difference. And we have decided that when we are looking at any, any uh, managerial level job and, and certain grade level jobs, uh, you, you, you can really find uh, that you get very narrow in your look for talent uh, the further up you go in an organization. So we've made a commitment that if we are going to uh, have, a, you know, have an opening at a leadership level, we want a diverse talent pool and, and, and choose from the best candidate always, but always make sure that we're challenging ourselves to be more broad in our thinking beyond the networking that our, uh, each of us may have which is, is narrow because of, of, of where each of us come from as well. So we're broadening the view of that. We're um, making sure that we take a, um, you know, take, take, really take a stance that it's important and it's how we create change in our organizations. So we're, we're really just getting underway in that work. We're really recognizing where we're at, but we think it's really important and we're committed to it. Thank you. Say, uh, when I don't know the answer, I ask somebody in banking, my question is this. With the tariffs that have been on again, off again out in Washington, D.C., uh, there's probably a forecast or formula you figure out as um, being on the Federal Reserve Board or bring Bremer Bank. How do you handle all the threats of tariffs, then not having them, then you have them again? How does, how does that uh, play into your role? Well, it, it's important to understand because a big segment of our client base is in the agricultural sector. What I would say is we're very committed to that sector in good times and bad. When, uh, when you work with farmers, you're making generational decisions. We have worked with farmers for generations, and our goal is to work for farmers for generations to come. And so it's really understanding the impact of that, um, their ability to uh, manage their business accordingly. It's really sitting down and being an advisor, being that, that person that uh, uh, our you know, expertise uh, in, within our group to have the right kind of conversation that understands the impact of that. Um, so I would tell you, we're, we're very engaged, we're very understanding, we, we frankly have you know, elevated risk in that portfolio, and we understand that because of what's going on in the world today. Um, there are all kinds of opportunities for us to work with clients successfully, um, and, uh, and every, every one of our, our bankers in that industry, or in that segment of our business, along with our credit team, are working very collaborative, collaboratively today to understand that. So, no easy answers. The hardest thing is the uncertainty about predicting the timelines, the, the, length, the length of that impact. Um, and it's challenging. There's no doubt it's challenging because there's other aspects of the agricultural industry that are challenging today too in terms of commodity prices and, and other impacts to that. So there's nothing easy about it today, but I would tell you our biggest um, opportunity and our commitment is to make sure we're sitting down proactively having conversations and understanding how we can be a good partner to anybody that's uh, really truly impacted by that. We have time for one final question. Hello. 
can you talk about how moving branding into human resources may have changed or enhanced your hiring practices? Well, and I should clarify one, one aspect of that. When we started the work on branding, it was critically, we had been an organization that had separate charters for decades. And so we had actually 14 different banks. And, and when I first got to Bremer, I got to Bremer seven years ago, I really felt like the only thing we had in common was a name. And so we had uh, really, you know, um, different organizations because we had these separate charters. Now there was nothing wrong with that, no one did anything wrong, it was just the evolution of, and in 2014 we combined all those charters to become one, uh, one organization, really coined the, the one Bremer at that time. And so it simply started out by saying we're one organization. Now we have such uh, richness around what it means to be one Bremer. But the, um, the importance of, of, of the brand work initially moving into human resources was because we had such different stories. I would go out to all of our different markets and I would hear Bremer described one way in, in one market very differently from a, a, another market. And that's not, there's no strength in a brand when you have a variety of different ways the story is being told. And so it was, it was just recognizing where we were at at that point in time. Thus, it really struck me that uh, we have to start with us, us as a team, uh, us as a group of people, understanding what we mean But when we talk about Bremer, how we um, think of ourselves, what is our culture, what's the customer experience, how do we show up, what are our, what are our differentiators? And so we started that work, and, and really painstaking work of a year, really doing a lot of self-reflection. When we were ready to go external and build the visual uh, elements of the brand and you know, create um, you know, the, the great videos that we have and the, 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 you know, the implementation of creating an understanding by the external marketplace to drive our growth, we moved brand into a co-ownership with both marketing and human resources. We're never gonna give up on understanding that people really drive and, and uh, reflect the brand and the, the sense of Bremer. It is the execution of the business. But brand is also really critically important externally to show up. So frankly, what we, we do is we don't really use the word brand. I mean, it's, it's part of who we are. It's in, so it's the work of the marketing team to create the external, to create the understanding, to really do customer research and, and uh, speak with customers and evaluate all that we are so that we can show up in the right uh, way to, to, that speaks to the customers that we're trying to speak to. And in the same time, on the internal side, we continue to impact our own understanding of how we best uh, execute who we are and our purpose as an organization. So it's, co it's jointly owned today, and it's... Uh, and it, and it's because we've got great leaders in both those groups to really bring that work together and frankly as a whole senior leadership team understand how we bring that work together to drive, drive our success as an organization. Thank you, Jean. That is absolutely wonderful.